Hello and welcome to a very special Film at LACMA conversation about FX's Emmy contending anthology series, Impeachment, American Crime Story. I'm Stacey Wilson Hunt and joining me today are writer and executive producer, Sarah Burgess and actor and executive producer, Sarah Paulson. Welcome to both of you and congratulations on the series. Thank you. Thank you. It feels like a lifetime since it aired. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. Uh, and I'm sure since you created it and Sarah P, since you went through your incredible physical transformation, what a last few years each of you has had. So firstly, thank you for working so hard to bring this story to us because I know it was very difficult. <laughs> so thank you for that. And I wanted to know, has there been any reaction to the show that has surprised you or uh, sort of enlightened <laughs> you or heartened you in a way? that you didn't anticipate? Because there was just a flurry of perspectives on this. How about you, Sarah Paulson? Um, I, do you hear that beeping truck? Is that really irritating? I apologize if you can hear it. I actually um, couldn't hear it. Hear it. Okay, I couldn't hear great. it. <laughs> um, was there anything that was surprising to me? I mean, I think anytime you create anything and you spend so much time, and particularly because we were working in a kind of COVID vacuum, all of it was surprising and unexpected I, I, for me, because I think, you know, you're so immersed in something and entrenched in the world of it um, that it's hard to, to see anyone else's perspective for me, other than Linda's. It was very um, all consuming and it was sort of the lens through which I saw the experience, obviously, sure. because I had spent so, such a long time playing her. Um, Probably the most surprising thing was was when um, Allison Tripp, uh, Linda's daughter, uh, gave an interview to Vanity Fair um, and spoke about uh, the experience of watching it with so much um, generosity and mm. kindness and wow. and also sort of communicated how much it had affected her that she felt that Sarah Burgess and, and Ryan and Brad and Nina and all of us um, had taken uh, more care than I think anyone had ever uh, deigned to um, bestow upon Linda, both in memory mm. and certainly when it happened. So I think she was surprised having been through what she had been through um, at her mother's side, that, that it wasn't just gonna be an assassination. Mm. Um, and I think that was very comforting to me that she responded that way, um, that it kind of put every other reaction uh, into a, a sort of um, a, a different place. It was like, mm. you're either Allison or you're everybody else. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. Right. And, and also, you know, for someone who is related to the person who obviously she has passed away, which is very sad mm -hmm. for her to feel like her heart wasn't broken by this, I'm sure is probably the ultimate compliment. And, and Sarah right. Burgess, this obviously is such an audacious television project for you as a playwright. What heartened you about the way that the storytelling was received? Because it really was so compactly told, very strategically told the way you divided up each part of this incredible story, which I have to say, I didn't know 90% of the story. Mm. That's what was so illuminating for me. So tell me about your perspective. It probably says a lot about my storytelling approach to this, that I had a very similar reaction to Allison's reaction. I was very, I took this job because I became obsessed with Linda. You know, I think I felt very aware that Monica Lewinsky had had already sort of um, taken back at least some control of the narrative um, and had written about it beautifully for Vanity Fair and participated in a documentary series. Um, I felt really connected to the real Linda trip that I detected when I was researching the story. Something in me always believed that Allison would, um, would like the show or would, would like what we did with Linda, but I remember like walking in DC and getting a text from someone at Vanity Fair that this like Allison piece had dropped. And I really was, I mean, I was sort of just in a, I mean, I experienced everything that happens to me as like a trauma, but I was like, felt very, <laughs> you know, I'm a very sensitive person. And I was like, you're oh, a writer. Like, Come on. I get it. Yeah, I know. But if I like, don't get a, like a restaurant reservation, I take it as like a, you know, I just become, I take it all as like an internal failure on my part. But I, I like, I was really speechless for like an hour reading that. And then it, she spoke again. And then I was worried that like when she watched the rest of the show, yeah, she changed her mind because like, I never wrote this show like quote unquote to like humanize Linda or to make people like Linda. I would be a psychopath if I was like, I want people to, I mean, to me, Linda was the protagonist, but by that I meant that like, um, you know, she made the story sort of happen. She's like, I wanted to be inside her experience um, and understand it. 
I also just found her very funny and smart and like unself-aware, but like you sort of, I, you don't hate her, at least I don't for that reason. But anyway, I was so nervous then to when I saw that, she, that Allison gave another interview after watching most of the show. And um, that has really carried me through. I mean, that just meant so much to me. Um, and there were things she said about Sarah's performance that I myself as like, I self-identified as like the world's leading expert on Linda Tripp, but like Allison talked about things that Sarah was doing that I didn't even notice that evoked wow. her mother, you know? Wow. Um, and so I feel like, I'll, you know, I never feel resolution for anything or nothing feels resolved for me ever, but I really, it's really not a lie. And the thing that like a showbiz writer says that it means a lot to me that Allison felt that way. Cause she just, she very clearly didn't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. um, and for her to feel so positively about something that's not, that I think what I love about this performance is it's, it's fearless portrayal of all that Linda did. We're meeting someone at, I think one of the worst periods in her life. And I don't think the, anything that we do sort of shies away from that, you know? Um, and so for Allison to react that way meant, meant a ton to me. And, and, that's, and that's tied into sort of this question of how to approach the story. I wouldn't have taken the job if I couldn't sort of orient it in Linda's perspective and just pursued my own obsession and interest with that over the course of this three year sort of epic experience, you know? Wow. And for each of you, what were the most, I guess, distinct or profound judgments that you thought you had about this story that you quickly had to talk yourself out of, or at least set them aside until you, you had the real Monica Lewinsky there to ask her in person? Because I certainly had thoughts about how much Monica was to blame and Linda was the villain. And I really had to just free myself of those and just throw myself into the story. How much of that did you have to consciously do? And Sarah Paulson, maybe you can begin to allow yourself to get into this artist's space in telling the story. I think it's possible that having worked with Steve McQueen on 12 Years a Slave and he had said to me something that was so helpful about playing that character, a person who had you know, no moral compass and was a real product of her time uh, and that she was the least self-aware person on the planet, um, Mistress Epps in, in 12 Years a Slave. And he, he kept saying to me, it is, it is literally um, will, will be in opposition to doing what you're, you're needing to do if you have any judgment of her. Um, or if you stand above her, um, it, it just doesn't help tell the story. And so, you know, as an actor, a lot of times, I think it is hard to not be concerned with this idea of, and this is something that is, I say this, um, this has never entered my mind for better or worse, what your brand is, you know, or like how it's going to affect um, people and, and whether or not you're going to be liked. And I think he gave me a real um, gift by telling me to, to you know, step out of the way of my own judgment of the character because then the sort of idea of trying to be um, understood or liked sort of went away from my, my pursuit in terms of the truthfulness of, of, of the character. And so when I entered into this, you know, I was doing so much research and reading so much and it was the Slow Burn podcast that I just kept listening to over and over and over again. And, and there was, there is something about her interview in that piece that just made it very evident to me that she was still, um, no matter how much she was saying, oh, I don't think about it anymore. And that's just not something I, you know, it was very clear that that wasn't true, whether she knew it or not. You know, you don't have post-it notes inside books on, you know, display where anybody could see them when they walked into your home, you know, about things that people got wrong about your story. Um, so it's so much of it was sort of and Sarah wrote, you know, and I'm not just saying this because she's here, I've said this, you know, to anyone who will listen, wrote such uh, a very brilliant script and she was so multidimensional on the page mm -hmm. that I didn't have to do some excavation to try to get to who is this person and um, how do I move aside my, my judgment? And of course, I had some surface, um, you know, John Goodman images in my brain of, of Saturday Night Live, oh, right. um, sketches about her um, in the sense that I guess I imagine my 20 year old self or however old I was around the time of 25, 20, who knows what it was, but um, <laughs> you were young, you were very young. That is not my strong suit, <laughs> but I remember having a very sort of cursory idea that maybe Linda Tripp, I just didn't even see her as a person. Mm. I didn't, I didn't see her as a person. She was like a, I, she just was, was not a human being to me. So mm. the main thing I was, was trying to do or, um, and the writing of the script allowed and all the things I was reading about it. So she just became so 
completely real to me in the in a human way. Um, and then there was there was nothing then for me to push aside. It became very clear to me why she did it. I understood it. I'm not saying I sanctioned it, believed uh, that it <laughs> right. was right, um, but I understood it. Um, and I was surprised that I understood it because I thought maybe, I guess I'm sort of finding my way to your answer, uh, to answer your question as I'm saying it, which is that I think as I was going along, it was like, oh, oh, I think I understand now the why. Right. And maybe right. there was a part of me in the beginning where I thought, I don't, I, I can't possibly see the road to how anybody could, could do something like this, you know, right. which was in, inherently my judgment sort of trying to figure out. Sure. Um, so and Sarah Burgess, you clearly laid out a wonderful methodology for not only Sarah as a performer to understand this, but for us as the audience, I found myself along the way going, oh, that makes sense. I see as just as a political player, why mm -hmm. she made that move, why she made that move. Tell me how you infuse those moments of, I guess, strategy, whether it be in scene direction or a line of dialogue along the way to continue to remind us this woman is in charge or she hopes to be in charge of her place along the beltway but also she made some mistakes but along the ride we are understanding her decision so tell me about that i mean i think i guess the best way to answer that is like i remember just reading linda in her own words and in interviews when i first was like becoming very enamored of this character wanting to write this very complicated person and it was very clear to me that she was smart and like a probably a, a, a moral thing about me is i just felt i don't know i just felt i i um, I felt like I understood who she was in a weird way. And I understood how she sort of overthought herself maybe into, and obviously engaged in some sort of motivated reasoning to tell herself she had to do this thing. Um, you know, I think there's something that I feel like we all have sort of, we, we all have moments of, we all sort of can be very cruel in our lives at times. And usually when you're doing that, you're telling yourself a story about why you have to do it. Um, and I saw that in her, um, as far as actually like, how do you transition that my own internal experience, which I'm like really centering in this conversation to like an actual script. I mean, this is such a well-documented event. Even the tapes, you hear her actual connection to Monica and the, and the manipulation at the same time, you know? So it felt, I guess all I would say is it felt very, it, the events themselves and Linda's a very, was a very verbal person. You know, she's never saying uh, what she's thinking or feeling explicitly, but you can read it very clearly. She's the kind of person who always says she's really, really busy so that you know she matters because she's obviously, you know, overcompensating for something, which is also something that we all do in our lives at certain times. Sounds like uh, Hollywood, by the way. <laughs> yes, I know. I thought about that all the time. Yeah, it, it is, right. Yeah. It's like the person who right. brought like, yes, a, a movie star coffee once and then constantly refers to them by their first name. Um, <laughs> but I like, I so I really like, it just felt very present for me and evident who she was. It was a, I've never had an experience writing a character like this. I mean, I've never written a real person before um, where it, her natural behavior lent itself so well, if you read the character correctly um, to, I think a, a clear understanding of the emotional and as you're saying, the sort of situational reasons for, for what she's doing. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting. And I'd love to talk about how each of you collaborated with Monica Lewinsky, who of course served as a producer on this project. Sarah Burgess, was she, kind of working with you as you were writing or was she vetting scripts after the fact saying, oh, this didn't feel totally accurate to me or this maybe tweaked this part? Like, was she that granular in her advice? Yes, it's the second one. She okay. um, she was not working with me, with me as I was writing or the other writers. Um, Monica was really, I mean, look, it was a long and complicated process that changed the way we worked together. Um, and she was very, Monica, unlike Linda, Monica does say what she's thinking directly. She did then and she does today. Something I really have so much affection for is you know, she will just be very, she's incredibly direct. And um, you, you know, I, which is not a very Hollywood thing, by the way. And I really appreciate yeah. it about her. Like she's really, so I would get all of her thoughts and feelings. I had to learn to adapt to maybe a granular, a granular note about a, a non-Monica character's dialogue and like protecting some of that. Unless she's saying to me, like, I knew this person and you're just wrong. Like they didn't say y'all, you have to, you know, whatever. But that, that right, never really right. came up. Um, there are a couple actually language things with Bill Clinton where she just legitimately was like, he wouldn't use that word. And I was like, okay, great. Um, but no, I would just get a, a, um, a, what I would describe as a lot of notes on every script. And then there was a process of then meeting with her and figuring out and talking through what 
I would do and what I, I wouldn't do, which is how you handle any notes from anybody. Um, and um, we just, we did that sort of the whole way through until the end. Wow. It makes me think of, there's a lot of discussion right now about shows that center on real life events and the artistic license that certain mm -hmm. writers have taken in amplifying those events, or in some cases, as the real people say, getting them totally wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And for each of you, you know, was there a balance with, okay, we don't know, necessarily know how this FBI meeting went, but let's pretend it went this way because it's kind of fun and give Colin Hanks a little jibe here and there. I mean, were you adding little flourishes along the way to make it sort of TV ready? Because I'm sure a lot of this stuff was probably pretty boring behind the scenes. I'm guessing I wasn't there, obviously. <laughs> but tell me a little bit about how you manage the, the TV factor, but also wanting to stay in the, the lane, making sure it's accurate. And Sarah Paulson, maybe you can even weigh in on that. Sure, I can weigh in on it, but I can't answer mm -hmm. the first part because I <laughs> sure. um, you know, I can only speak uh, from the acting standpoint of um, we were never, I mean, I, I have never been, and Sarah Burgess has never been, although we are desperately sad about it, have never been in Linda's house. Um, so we could not know exactly what she was doing or feeling or how she did X, Y, and Z things or some of the things that happened behind closed doors, but, um, and not to sort of, you know, continue to reference work of mine from the past, but on People versus OJ, it was, some of it was not, it was not dissimilar in the sense that like, mm -hmm. I didn't have a transcript of what Marsha was thinking and feeling. Sure. We had a lot of footage, like we have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of um, audio uh, in this uh, show with the tapes in terms of like, but I can't actually know, you know, in any real fundamental way. I can make my best educated guess because of the research that I've done and what the scripts are um, showing me. But that's when it that's when it sort of comes down to, for me anyway, that that impossible to describe sort of um, alchemy of something where you like the emulsion of what I don't know why and how sometimes with particular characters and I unlike Sarah Burgess, ha have played real people like more often than not, which is a sort of bizarre mm -hmm. thing to say, uh, but I really have. And I do, I find it to be incredibly liberating. I've said this before that like having a blueprint of a house and knowing exactly how the thing is built means I have much more freedom within that to make what I feel can sometimes feel like bolder choices because I have information that feels not up to me to de decipher. It's like, well, no, this actually happened. In this moment, we know happened. So what is the middle, what does the middle of the road look like from the point A and B that we actually know are, are um, you know, I was going to use, mix my metaphors and say structurally sound, but that's not, <laughs> I should have gone with the highway. I should have gone with the car, but I, I, I couldn't do it. But um, so for me, it is, there is that, I want to call it magic almost because I don't I don't know what the how Sarah could know exactly um, what Linda might be doing in this moment or how I could know emotionally what she might be feeling uh, in that moment. But sometimes it just um, reveals itself, and I do think it comes from how you listen mm. to the information that you are getting or how you take in the information you're getting. And something you're reading, a book about her, or listening, reading a transcript. Um, it's impossible for me to read a trip like we read the transcripts from the you know from um oh my god Sarah Burgess what was it called wow wow uh what was I doing what was I doing in episode nine it was my oh the um, grand oh yeah yeah testimony. the grand jury testimony yeah. Ooh, um but when you read the, all of that the transcripts that sort of you know we had to compress um, yeah a lot, a lot of that right that it's like but when you hear it's like it's impossible for me not to hear Linda's intonations and to not sort of imagine to not know that she was making a she was kind of making light of something when it was totally misperceived as some other thing that pro marshals you know I mean she I, I just um I don't know so 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 I don't know I don't know it just I don't even know how some of it happens but I do think it is the, the difference between listening to a podcast and then and and and, and dramatizing it is that you you do want to have this sort of imagined uh, scene that may be talked about, but you do want to see it. It sort of separates it from anything you might read or anything you might listen to. So, um, but I don't know how you do that from a structural writing standpoint. Aren't you glad I answered first? <laughs> <laughs> I am. Well, it's actually made me want to focus my, my question for Sarah Burgess more distinctly, which is how do you think your training as a playwright facilitated your ability to do this? Because the way you write and I am not a theater person, Sarah, you are sort of the veteran here, Sarah P and Sarah B. 
that I when I when I watch this, I can tell that a Hollywood person didn't write this. And insofar as it feels more nuanced, it feels more character building. So I'm wondering, how do you think that facilitated your ability to execute this, your background in writing for the stage? Well, that's really nice of you to say. I mean, there's certainly a lot of Hollywood scripts that really that are really wonderful. And there are a lot oh, of mediocre sure. plays. I would go see them all the time. And I've written them too. We've all seen um, mediocre versions of everything at this point. Yeah. Although mediocre plays a very specific thing because you can't leave and you just, there's a really weird mental thing that happens that like you just, you know, you're in there for like two more hours. But I still love them. And like a one, and I've had like one great performance from like, a, you know, a great New York stage actor can make that it all worth seeing it. And that happened to me recently. Um, all that to say is like my like tourism commercial for New York is like, I, um, <laughs> Um, you're asking why did I, how did my theater experience? I think there's a lot of freedom in theater. You can just write, I, you know, a 40 page scene. Um, I write things that are often, so there's a lot of talking in what I write. These are very, you know, and which is appropriate for this story. You know, this is like a, um, <laughs> there's a lot of talking about what I write is a great branding exercise, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I just, um, aside from I'm bumped by your Hollywood comment, I'm trying but I think that like, I, you know, I, I, I think that like, there is a lack of restraint on the writer. I also think that for someone who can be kind of shy and meek or like very, very anxious all the time, theater does give you a lot of strength because you do see like, you hold the copyright to your material. You have most, you have a lot of power. I mean, not always the most power, it depends on like who, what the theater is and the director and sometimes the actors, but that was very helpful. Also like, you see your, if you're lucky, you see your play done multiple times. So you learn a lot about all that your writing contains or, or doesn't, you know? Mm, um, wow. I don't know that I thought a lot about, you know, I mean, and finally that, that grand jury scene in episode nine is more like a play than other things. I was very obsessed with like casting those jurors and what's happening between Linda and the jury and, and Monica and the jury. I really enjoyed writing those for that reason because um, like a play, it's a single set and it's just like people sort of going back and forth and it's it's about that conflict. Um, but I don't, I can't answer a lot more, you know, you're always going for nuance and sometimes I know I fall short. Um, yeah. I also, thank you for saying that, but I, I also like, you know, I, I know that I also, and this is true in my plays too, I'm struggling with this now actually, is like, I will always enter a play through a, a character. I will allow myself a distorted perspective, frankly, on the story because of my um I think impulse that I can't control to really be with one character and that had real implications for this story for sure for the reasons I talked about earlier mm -hmm. and so that is one sort of connection to what I've done before that maybe is a little different from that's just really starting with character. yeah no, that's really interesting this idea that when you're a playwright you're whether or not you want it, your work's constantly being workshopped and dissected over and over and over again. And that's something that a TV writer, even though he or she may do an episode that's rehearsed many times, then it's over and you move on to the next script. Mm -hmm. But for potentially years, you have people dissecting every word you've written. And I imagine that's also, painful, but also incredible. Yeah. Also, I, I remember a, a, a friend of mine who is a, a wonderful playwright did say, you know, in the theater, and I you can tell me if, if he's wrong about this, Sarah, but that playwright is king like it is yeah. it is the, the writer and and sometimes in in these environments in television and movies it is not it is not always like that um and that can be I think a a, a big sort of stark difference in in those two experiences that is yeah. so true absolutely and my final question for each of you is has two parts which is what are you most proud of and having executed this herculean task of telling the story and what have you most learned from the other person that you've taken with you since this project? So Sarah Burgess, I'll have you start. Um, I'll always be very, I think, proud of this portrayal of Linda. I think that I, um, I'm almost still too close to Linda to sort of fully see all of it. I, I don't, I've never had an experience in my life like the creation of this character and working on it with Sarah, where we actually didn't talk a ton about Linda in the run-up to making it, but it was just, um, I've never quite seen a performance contain everything that exists in what you've written, but also to see like, I think all that was, uh, the imagination and intelligence, like going beyond even what's on the page for a character that I think was like, in some ways the extent of what I'm currently capable of. I feel very proud to have participated in that. And and that's also why, as I said earlier, you know, the Allison thing meant a lot to me. Um, I've learned a lot from, you're asking what I've learned from Sarah. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I, I, it will take me a long time to process so much of this experience, but I feel like Sarah's commitment to this character and all the sort of immense, like the brilliance that she has to bring to it. Um, there, there are times in this show where I felt so, it was like actually very calming to work with an actor like that because like there were times that I would like want to sort of remove stage directions to be in this collaboration just with Sarah to see, like to see what she would do. Mm. I think there's a, I do think it's really, this sounds like a lot, but like, I think I saw something that a type of, there's something that I saw uh, possible when it comes to sort of performing my writing that I think I will be seeking now and sort of forever. Um, mm because of working with Sarah, you know, um, a very high bar changed my idea of what it's changed my, I think my idea a little bit of what is, what's possible. Hmm. That's how very nice. Sarah anything? Paulson, how does that feel to hear? That feels, um, <laughs> overwhelming to me. Um, just because I have such reverence for Sarah's writing. I mean, I'll never forget the first time I read the script and I closed it and I said, well, that's the best thing I've ever read. And I couldn't wow. believe that I was going to get to play this person. And at that time, it felt so far away from me and I wasn't quite sure how I would do it, but I could not believe. And this was a very early iteration that even had scenes that we never ended up shooting, you know, Linda driving in a car and, you know, early, early things. Um, but I just couldn't believe the complexity of it. And I was totally terrified about how I could do justice, if I was going to be able to do justice to mm -hmm. what she had written. Um, but in terms of the thing I'm the most proud of, I have to echo a bit of what Sarah said about Alice. There's something about the way it landed for Allison that made it somehow feel all worth it because it was really hard, the whole experience. I mean, some of it just, you know, revolving around COVID, this was pre-vaccines and we were working pre-vaccines um, and it was scary. And, uh, you know, Beanie and I were kind of clutched to each other the whole time. And it was incredibly bonding and wonderful uh, in that regard, but it was also isolating and strange. And it was a new way of working that was, that made everything feel so separate. And we couldn't have the same kind of connectivity that we normally do when we're working um, a kind of across the board. Um, so that was really hard, but to walk away from it, you know, love it or leave it, you know, people have it resonate with them or not the daughter of the woman that, uh, as Sarah said, was the protagonist of this story who had been nothing but humiliated uh, and sort of had her name dragged through the mud um, for, the, you know, for her life uh, following this event, even though some of this was at her hand, doesn't mean that she wasn't a human being who had um, to walk and carry that around with her, however willing or unwilling she was to process that. Uh, but to have her child all these years later to feel that her mother had been seen in a way that was, and, and I, I can say, I think quite confidently that I don't think this was some kind of shellac sugar-coated version of Linda where her flaws and her ugliness, and I mean internal, uh, I actually found Linda to be a quite, a I mean, I, you don't want to talk to me about this because I can really talk about this. <laughs> she's very um, fascinating yeah. and she's very funny. She's I mean, there's very, a lot very to love funny. about her. Yeah. She's very funny and there's a lot to love about her. And I think there was a reason that Monica was attracted to her in the first place in terms mm -hmm. of like their, you know, that there had to be something, you know, uh, about Linda that was, you know, anyway. But I think the Allison thing was a, was a very um, mm -hmm. meaningful thing to me, probably the most meaningful thing uh, in retrospect to know that it landed with her uh, almost as significantly as it landed with me having done it um, and then it moved her and made her feel that she 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 had said that she wished her mother could see it and if I can imagine Linda Tripp being a person who every time would be depicted on screen or every time there would be to, to sort of hide from that but to wish that her mother could have witnessed it is uh, um, incredibly powerful for me and will always feel like it means, it means that we, you know, we got something right, we really did. Mm -hmm. and, and that has to be everything. But in terms of uh, Sarah, Sarah has kind of, uh, Sarah Burgess has sort of ruined me, I feel for, <laughs> for, some, um, for other writers, because I do kind of, um, it's interesting that you think one of your shortcomings is sort of seeing things through a character. And I understand that you're talking about maybe writing something right now. And I wonder <clears throat> where my offer is, but that's a different, <laughs> a different subject. Um, but it's on its um, way. It's on yeah, its way. <laughs> but, but it, um, you know, 
it's almost that thing of like, one, you can never not know what you know once you know it, you know? And it's like, now I actually know what it means to have writing that uh, can push me beyond anything I could have ever imagined. I had no idea if I could do this part. And I have very rarely looked at my work and been like, that's good. That work is good, very rarely. But I do feel proud of my work in this thing, as proud as I've ever felt about anything I've ever done. And that is, uh, I give Sarah a tremendous amount of credit for that. And also I've just never worked with someone who was so uh, collaborative and um, truly interested in figuring something out together that made me realize not only was that possible, but that it is the desired way to work and that only, only good things can come from that. Um, that and also she really likes sparkling champagne, which is <laughs> there's no non sparkling champagne, but we both enjoy it. <laughs> not, <laughs> we both enjoy the same cocktail. <laughs> that is huge, by the way, it especially during a difficult <laughs> yeah. shoot. Yeah. Well, I want to thank each of you for being here, and I'm so glad you found each other. And that was yeah. you telling the story because the DNA of this, the female energy, and the care. And and just the the empathy that you each felt for all these characters, it really came through. And and maybe in other hands that wouldn't have been the case. So I want to thank you for doing such a beautiful job and giving Allison the gift of potentially closure. Maybe that's not the word she would use, but yeah. the closest proximity to that that she may have. So thank you. Or at least she's not walking around feeling like her mother got sort of sucker punched. Uh, right. You know, right? No, from the no, grave. You know, it's, it's like it's just really. It was very traumatic, her losing her mother the way she I, did. Very I can't, traumatic. I truly can't imagine. It's, so it would have been a real assault, I think, if it had been something that hit her in the wrong way, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for your hard work and stay well, and hopefully we can see you working together again. I can't wait. If it doesn't happen, <laughs> I'm never working again. Until <laughs> me too, believe me. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you guys, bye. Bye, bye.